So thank you so much for joining us on the panel. Um, as I said, I think it's pretty conclusive. We need dyslexic thinking in the workplace. Um, we know we've got a lot to do in the workplace, but somehow that's a bit easier because it is about awareness, changing perception. Um, and I know as a charity, we have lots of resources to help employers to do that. Um, in, when we look at education, that's a bit tougher because we've got a, a bigger journey to, to travel on. Um, but we do actually know what we need to do. So I think on this panel, I'd like to, to explore two things. Firstly, how do we level the playing field so dyslexic children can flourish and thrive in the system that we have? And then also have a look at what do we actually need to change the education system to, to be nurturing and educating the kind of minds that we know the future needs. So if I can start with you, Princess Beatrice. Um, you are also the patron of the Helen R. Kell Centre, which was the first centre in the UK to train teachers. It's actually where I trained as a specialist teacher. Um, and they supported you as well, I think. Yes, so um, I began my dyslexic journey at age seven when, you know, probably like many in this room, the words on the page suddenly found themselves dancing off into the room. And uh, I was lucky enough to be um, supported by the Helen R. Kell Centre. And what I've learned about my discovery about being made by dyslexia is that I was incredibly lucky to have the types of teachers and the specialist support um, that the centre really did offer. And it was a, it's a fantastic charity that's going on to create lots of opportunities for teachers. But... I think one of the most important things that we need to do is take that particular learning and make sure that every teacher has that opportunity to understand what what's possible. Um, and I think it not only could help dyslexics in the classroom, but also could help teachers um, with their own abilities as well, because you know teachers are our first line of defense for every child. And whether you're dealing with all sorts of different um, communication issues. I think dyslexic thinking is is so empowering to be able to give that in the hands of the teachers. I think is so important. Yeah, absolutely. And the Helen R. Kell Centre also is very strength focused. Um, I can remember that through all of the training that I did there. Yeah, they. I was inc I was incredibly lucky. Um, but I think with how how we approach dyslexic thinking now it is about making sure that those teachers really have what they need to make sure that we, we got that first line of defense covered um you know teachers have been you know probably to not credited enough i think with um how they've been able to transition through the pandemic and we've seen the sort of teaching profession as something that um you know we can really make a difference if we're strengthening, if we can strengthen it for them. And that's going down to talking about general well-being, um, mastering, you know, master classes, and, you know, adding a dyslexic sort of recognition to their CVs as well could go on and could be a, you know, quick win. And I know it's something that you've been very passionate about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are completely passionate about training every single teacher. Um, and all of our mission is aligned with the UN SDGs. So by, 2020, by 2030, we aim to train every teacher in the world. Yeah. Um, and if we sort of go a little bit in slightly not... Because Helen Arkell Centre was set up in the 70s, wasn't it? Was she it was. I mean, Helen Arkell, unfortunately, she's no longer with us. She passed away when she was 95. But she was one of the first people um, in, in the UK to really recognise dyslexic thinking. And when she, you know, when she founded the organisation, there was really no such thing as, you know, what was dyslexia. And, and you know, I think when you think about some of the diagnosis of the people that have gone on now, you know, we saw on this, the screen, you know, one in five, one in five. I mean, when she was teaching, I mean, dyslexia hadn't even been really thought of. And actually, it's such an opportunity that we have to change the narrative. We talked about that before, about how exciting it is to be dyslexic, that, you know, we've really got to do everything that we can in order to change the narrative to make it acceptable. I'm also not saying it's hard, it's going to be easy you yeah. know, for the individual, but you know, recognising that, that those strengths, those tools, those resilience, those opportunities um, is equally as important. Absolutely. And the right support um, enables us to thrive. Yeah. So, Gavin, if we can come to you, because you're the headmaster of Millfield School, which was the first school in the world to um, support dyslexic students and, again, very much strengths-focused. Um, and it would be lovely for you to share a little bit about the story of Millfield and what you think needs to happen. Thank you. 
if, if I do my job properly, there'll be a sort of moment of euphoria and then a small crushing depression in what I'm going to say. Let's see if I tell the story <laughs> properly. Um, <laughs> In, in 1935, a visionary guy called Boss Meyer is educating six Indian princes and he vows to get them into a good school in the UK. And three of them have word blindness, the forerunner to dyslexia, and no good school would take those children because they regarded them as being educationally deficient. And he thought that was iniquitous, and so he founded Millfield. And Millfield was founded on a philosophy in 1935 that there was brilliance in every child and that it was the responsibility of the adults working with those children to find that brilliance wherever it lay and to use whatever means were necessary to discover that brilliance and to play to strengths. So hopefully you've got the euphoria moment there. 80 years on, almost 100 years on, <laughs> and nothing seems to have changed. Uh, uh, because at Millfield, we have, we're Europe's biggest boarding school. Um, we've got about 2,000 learners. 45% um, of those have an additional educational need. The majority of those have dyslexia. And in no way is it a barrier to anything. And there is one thing I wanted to add which, to what was being said earlier, Kate, which is that sometimes in schools there is a perception that certain subjects should be off-limits to dyslexic learners. You can't do English because you are dyslexic. That's a load of tripe. Uh, and our experience has been that, I'm sure we'll come on to this later, but if you use the right techniques, if you level the playing field, then there is no subject that is off limits. And we regularly see students taking English literature, taking history, taking very text-heavy subjects, taking languages to the highest level, just because we have changed the way that we do things. Fantastic. And Josh, your school, the Skank School, the head of the Skank School, that was the first school in elementary school in the US to support dyslexia. And you're also um, chair of the IDA, International Dyslexia Association, too. And I've been very lucky, having visited your school, to see the founders' words all around the school that are so inspiring and full of, of messages of strength. Yes, sir. It, it's uh, very similar to, to the uh, Millfield story of over 62 years ago, David Skank in Atlanta, Georgia, who himself was dyslexic, did not know it, just struggled to read, and he started to work with students where he saw himself in them. And he started to realize, well, wait a minute, these kids look like me, they think like me. And so he started a school in the, in the basement of a church. And what, what, what impressed me so much, and, and David passed away before I had the opportunity to, uh, to meet him, but what he was always committed to is not only are we going to help these kids? We're going to celebrate these kids. This is not a place where we fix people. This is not a doctor's office where we're trying to correct something. It's a place where we come and we celebrate how you think, how you learn, and we move that forward. And today, again, over 60 years later, that's, that's how the school continues to operate. And I, I think that is so important and such a piece of this message. Because in the earlier panel, I thought uh, uh, Maggie did such a wonderful job when she shared that part of our challenge in the workplace right now is, is awareness. We're not doing enough to make people aware. And right now in schools, with the exception of, of, of the children that have the benefit of coming to a mill field or a skank, who are often children of privilege, who are often children who have that rarefied opportunity, when you're dyslexic, if we talk about it at all, we're going to stick you in a hallway or we're going to put you in a special classroom down the hall, but we're not going to discuss it. We're not going to uh, bring in your peers to the conversation. And nobody wants to hire the kid that had to go in the hallway, right? Uh, you avoid that person on the playground. Uh, and so I think it's so important not only to ensure that we are helping kids, but going back to uh, what Millfield was founded on, what Skank was founded on, we're here to celebrate kids and how they think and how they learn and push that forward in addition to just supporting them. So I think there's a sort of very strong theme coming out here, which is it's about skilling up teachers so they can spot the strengths and support the challenges. And we've known how to do that since the 1930s. Full transparency, I was actually at Millfield, and it completely transformed my life. So it's one of the reasons I'm so passionate and, and do what I do. Um, we have created free teacher training with Microsoft. Um, it's video-based. It features teachers from both Josh and Gavin schools, um, and it's very empowering for teachers. Um, Deirdre, 
obviously, I know that's something that is something you're very passionate about, but also technology plays a massive role in levelling the playing field for these kids. Absolutely. The, the role of technology is critical, and I see it from two lenses, one in, wearing my Microsoft hat, building education products and solutions, and also as the mom of a 13-year-old daughter with dyslexia. And so I see uh, the, the amazing tools that are out there that really help reduce the barriers and truly level the playing field. Um, my daughter uses things like Read Aloud and Immersive Reader, Line Focus, which just helps her to focus when she's doing her schoolwork. Um, she also uses Immersive Reader in Minecraft when she's playing and has the text read aloud to her. And in all those situations, whether it's um, studying, homework, in class, uh, playing games online with their friends, it just it reduces the barriers. Um, it's also so much opportunity to use technology to reduce the stigma. So like we've been talking about, um, being able to do re reading and fluency assessments using machine learning. Um, we have a tool called Reading Progress that the students will read and, and record themselves reading, and it actually evaluates that um, picking up on, on speed, on omissions, on self-corrections, and provides that data to the teacher, to the educators, and also to the students. And, and we're hearing something surprising, which is students are asking for more reading practice. They enjoy doing that. There's something that's almost gamified about that. So it's really exciting to see how technology can both empower the educators, um, increase awareness, and also help the learners. Um, Minister Lena, I know you're dyslexic yourself and very, very passionate about creating equality within the Swedish school system. Um, tell us a little bit about your story and, and what you'd like to see, the change you'd like to see. It's a privilege to be here today and to talk about these issues. It brings back so many memories and actually see the strength in dyslexia. I think it's so good and I think it's a, it, this is the start of a journey that we have to move on and it has to go through the system, HR, companies and also the school system. Uh, and, and to agree with, with the previous speakers here, the, the teacher quality profession, I think there's a lot of things we need to do there. And also I think the, the, the compensation and so on. But I think there is another level and, of course, the, the way we need to see the strength in it. Uh, I think sometimes we have set a standard for how people should be, and dyslectic people is not included in the standard role model. And I think sometimes when we write a curriculum, this is the way what you should, could, should be able to produce, that everything should be written, everything should be presented in a certain way. It, it's an exclusive way of... Being. So if we accept that 8% of the human population is in a certain way, we can't say it's not normal. So I think we need to say that we are the new normal, mm -hmm. you know, and we better get it as quick as possible. Because now we are, I think, now when we have a system, a system is actually setting a standard for what society think is right and also setting what is wrong. I think we have a lot of people today that are dyslectic that actually grow up and valuing themselves less. And I think that's the biggest loss we can see in humanity. People who actually do have skills, but they don't see, they can't love themselves. So that's why the role models and actually we say it's not fair that 8% of the population do not fit in and need to struggle. We need to set the standard in a different way. And I, I know that's a long journey, but we, can, we, we have to see the, the, the things we're doing now, but I think we have to set a new standard for what we human beings are. It's the same thing with other things in society that we struggle for, you know, being homosexual or other things. You know, it's quite normal. We have to address it like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, dyslexics like to get things done. We're in a hurry. We like to move <laughs> yeah. things forward very quickly. And one of the things that this assembly is aiming to do is, is help to train every single teacher. Um, so I think that is something to, to level the playing field if every single teacher knows how to spot and support a child, dyslexic child in the classroom, the system will change. And our training is very, very strength focused as well. Um, 
But in Sweden, you um, you have a, a lot more freedom and creativity in your system, I believe, don't you? You don't have the same sort of standardised tests as we do in a lot of the rest of the world. I think we are going on a journey that sometimes we, we talk about more standards, more centralised testings. And we also have a part in our curriculum where we actually open up for different ways of learning, presenting and showing that you know things. But I think we are on a journey and still we see a, a, quite a big percentage of students who actually go to school and look around and say, hey, I don't fit in here. So we have a long journey ahead and, and teacher quality, also see the strength in every child and also see that most children... They grow up and become perfect, normal human beings. So, so we should have a more inclusive system. And I think that's the biggest role, the thing that I bring with me to the chair that I'm possessing today, that we need a school system that doesn't exclude. Because in my own journey, I remember it was quite nice, first of all, that I had a father who told me, you know, hey, I can't write and I can't read. Hey. So if you get it, it's not the end of the world. Because then I knew I loved my father. And if I can love a dyslectic, I know people could love me too. So that was a good way. And also see famous people, you know, coming out in a certain way is important. But, but we, 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 we need to work that keep the, the students in the system, make them feel normal because it is normal. And, and also celebrate the, the strengths. I th thought of this could be like the X-Men sequel, the dyslexic. <laughs> you know? Yeah, 100%. 100%. 100%. Yeah. So what we really need to do is to create a school system um, that actually teaches non-dyslexics to teach like us or to think like us because we clearly have the skills that the future needs. So maybe that's the, the challenge for you as, as schools minister. Yeah, actually said we are the new normal. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And um, we do know that only um, only one in five dyslexic children are being picked up at school. And I think that's a sort of a global statistic, to be honest with you. Um, Deirdre, I know you've done lots and lots with gaming. Um, that's obviously going to have a massive um, future focus. What are your thoughts on that? What are Microsoft's plans around that? Yeah, one thing we've seen with, with game-based learning and bringing games into traditional, traditional education is that it, it can really reach some of those learners that maybe don't fit in a traditional classroom environment. It provides another way to express themselves, to express ideas, maybe another assessment tool instead of sitting down and taking a test or writing a paper. Imagine if you could create a presentation about the history of this library and share that through Minecraft or share that through a video. So I think there's some really interesting opportunities to, to relook at assessment models um, and to to bring some of the more creative disciplines and more creative storytelling into traditional and mainstream education. We've been able to do that with Minecraft um, and really encourage um, STEM subjects, um, computer science and coding, and just tap into these skills and the superpowers that, again, don't, don't show up in some of the traditional assignments or group projects. Um, I've, you know, spending time in a class where students are using Minecraft, you see skills emerge. You see someone who is maybe a little bit on the edge of the classroom in the project and not participating. And this one young girl, she got into the Minecraft world and she was in the chat telling people, okay, you go over here and do this. No, you're not doing that right. And so that really unlocked that superpower for her. So I'm, I'm excited to see what, how games, how videos, how um, more of the content creation tools and technology can, can help unlock those superpowers. And create confidence in the skills that people do have. And Gavin, what do you think of the UK education system and, and the testing? Do, do you think that that's going to create... Leading question. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have Matt Hancock in the audience. <laughs> He'll be listening to this point. Um, what do I think? I think that four-fifths of what we need to do is really, really straightforward, and it could be done honestly within a week. It could all be put in place within about a week. One-fifth is a little bit more complicated, and that's where we need the likes of the, the, the minister to help. Um, it's often politically alluring, I think, for um, governments or ministers to say the youth of today are not where they were before, so we need to tighten things up, and therefore we ought to do things a bit more like we used to do them. Um, and I think that's probably a false route 
to go down. And in my experience, having done this for 25 years now, I think, the youth of today display far more adaptability and creativity in their approach than I ever did when I was at school. So I think it's actually a myth that things are going downhill. I think they're going fantastically uphill in the right direction. Um, but what we need to do is we need to train every teacher. It's a straightforward job to do that. You just say it needs to happen. It's a short piece of training. Uh, we need to screen every child. It's a short piece of work to do that. You need to change your culture where you emphasise brilliance and you focus on strengths rather than weaknesses. You want to create a culture which says in every project group you want a dyslexic because if you have a dyslexic in that project group, you will be a better project group. But, but fundamentally, and this is the one-fifth that we need some help with, uh, in many countries around the world, and the UK is a particularly bad example of this, we have an assessment system which is really archaic and it emphasises a bunch of skills and strengths that are largely irrelevant now. And in the UK, we brand a child who doesn't pass English and maths at 16 a failure. Mm. And of all children, of all the population, 71% of, of children pass those exams. So 29% are branded a failure. If you look at dyslexic students... 35% pass, so 65% are branded a failure. And then what do we do? We tell them that they must retake those same exams again and again and again. And now we tell them that if they don't pass those exams, they can never go to university because they are such failures. And I think that that's the fundamental bit that we've got to change, which is we have... Uh, I, and I'm happy to confess it, we have an education system which is, is, is sort of riven with hierarchical prejudices from, from a long time ago, and we need to think far more creatively than that. And we know what the answer is. We know the answer is there. It's ongoing assessment. It's using tools to level the playing field. It's adapting so that people can present their answers in multiple different ways. And my last point is this, if I can, which is that... Um, the fundamental thing that everyone needs to understand is that whatever is good for a dyslexic learner is good for every learner. And if we just taught what was best for dyslexics, everyone would get better. So it really is a magic bullet. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Josh? Uh, I would agree with what everyone uh, uh, just said and, and echo all those comments. And I think one thing that, that is important for everyone to walk away with, because I think it could be a revelation at times, when we say we need to train teachers, that's because the vast majority of teachers globally, regardless of the, the pedigree of their prior education, the teacher training program they attended, the vast majority never mention the word dyslexia, let alone spend any time talking about how you spot and support that. So that's that's why training every teacher is so important because there's a gap there's an enormous gap in almost all of our schools in that area um, and I would also agree that too often in schools, we rely on a standardized measure that not only is, is, is a poor uh, uh, evaluation of a child's actual ability, we over-index it in terms of their potential and their trajectory in school. So not only are we we're not learning what we want to know, but then we're also giving it more consequence than it deserves to limit what kids can do. I always say in schools, we, we spend too much time working problems and not enough time solving problems. And I, I look back at school and I, and to this day, I am terrible at the math worksheet that comes in front of me where I have this, this problem that has no context whatsoever that I have to solve in an arbitrary amount of time. And if I can't, all of these uh, decisions and consequences are made for where I go next. And it turns out I've never had to do that as a an adult. Uh, there's never a point. I look for it every time. Uh, no one has handed me that worksheet and say, you have 30 minutes, go. Uh, and so I don't understand why in schools, when we're preparing them for the workforce, we're preparing from that panel, why, why does it not better reflect our reality? And I think to your point, I, I think too much nostalgia can be the enemy of, of education because we all think it was so great. And it wasn't, right? It wasn't. Um, but for whatever reason, we, we convince ourselves that the past is, is the solution to the future and, and obviously not. And Princess Beatrice, I know you've done amazing work with The Big Change. 
Well, I mean, just to echo what you said as well, like I think sometimes the word sort of reimagining education almost feels so big that you don't know where to start. So how can you actually break it down into sort of bite-sized pieces where you can have a global conversation and you can ask permission to clear up some misunderstandings? I mean, how often is it that, I mean, I'm doing this now with it, taking a, a six-year-old through an education journey, and it's like, you know, how often do you have to put aside your own your own fears or um, sort of questions about the about your own education and go, actually, what do I need to be prepared for to have that conversation for the future? And, um, you know, really sort of letting go of letting go of the past as well. So, you know, at Big Change, we um, founded the organization based on answering a question uh, is, you know, how can we do more to reimagine education? And we've kind of started this process and it's, it's been fascinating to understand that, you know, where we are right now, our system is set up to be incredibly exclusive. And actually, education is one of the best, the best tools when we should be thinking about inclusive environments and equality. And we've automatically created something that is creating dividers. And standardized testing, you're creating filters almost. And, you know, we need to... Um, you know, all of these things need to be broken down, but sometimes we just need to ask permission to clear up that misunderstanding and ask why and, you know, get together in forums like this so that we can each take a little bit of learnings from employers to schools to, you know, to, to great thinkers and, and sort of so much of the education system is brilliant and our benchmarks with which we should be absolutely priding ourselves on. Um, so, you know, we have so much to be thankful for, so we don't have to actually do that much. I, I completely echo what you said. We can do some great things, um, great things really well quite quickly. Fantastic. I know that we're, we're over time now, so I think we better wrap. But just, mm -hmm. just to say, um, uh, we have lots of dyslexic people on here. We're very good at solving problems, and I think we've just solved the education problem. <laughs> <laughs> every single teacher, get rid of standardised tests yeah. and find what every single person is good at, and that works for dyslexics, and it works for absolutely everybody. 